Hello, this is Tasha and Kilios. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Welcome back to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, the podcast that explores the colorful world of Doctor Who collecting, those who collect in all kinds of Doctor Who merchandise, and sometimes we just talk about Doctor Who. Great place to do that. Uh, Brought to you in part by Forbidden Planet and Bags Unlimited Incorporated. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host and producer, and I've been a Doctor Who collector now for 42 years. So since 1981, I've been doing this. Uh, Welcome to our 64th episode, celebrating 60 years of Doctor Who, and uh, we're excited for this year. Um, I opened up one of the first Doctor Who stores in Chicago back in 1984 that actually exclusively served Doctor Who fans. In other words, we didn't have a brick-and-mortar place. We took our stuff uh, from fan club to fan club, and eventually that turned into fruit, and we called the... um, uh, the store Bundles from Britain, which I made up when I was 15 years old after I had a pretty sizable inventory of Doctor Who items that I was uh, fine with my collection. I had lots of stuff that I could sell. So it was really quite um, a lucrative thing. Um, of course, fast forward a few years, you know, after lots of success, uh, had a partner, um, sold my half of the business to the to my partner. And that was back in 1989. Of course, uh, we fast forward a long time and I find a book called Red, White and Who, The History of Doctor Who in America, and found my little company on page 384. So that really blew my mind. You can find a link to buy this book now. It's out of print, I believe, but you can get copies uh, from Amazon.com. You might pay a little bit more for it these days, but everyone should have a copy of this book. Um, You can go to DoctorWhoCollectors.com, and there's a link there to Amazon. Uh, We are part of the Direction Point Doctor Who Podcast Network. What an exciting thing to be part of a network that actually helps Doctor Who podcasters, as opposed to a network that does nothing for Doctor Who podcasters. So I'm still scratching my head why this network isn't twice the size. But hey, it will be. Um, So directionpoint.org is the website. And if you are a Doctor Who podcaster, jump on board because there's no cost or obligation. And that's something people don't believe. But that's true. There is no cost. There is no obligation. Um, We have, of course, in our network, great podcasts such as Time Streams, Police Box in a Junkyard, the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, Doctor Who Literature, Traveling the Vortex, and many, many more. And speaking of links, I always give these links out in every episode because you don't have to start at the beginning. If you want to go back to episode one and listen to my talk through on the Dalek book, it's a great listen, but it's before we got our format. You know, I was just starting out. It's a great episode, though, but you can start at any point, find the topics you're interested in, find the guests you want to listen to, and there you go. So we thank you for listening. Two great links. First of all, if you want to keep track of your media items uh, of Doctor Who for free or create a want list or look for uh, links to buy, go to timelash.com and select TARDIS Library and you can keep track of your books, vinyl, CDs, Betamaxes, whatever you got for free there. Um, That's a special thanks to Mr. Dan O'Malley who keeps that site up and running. Um, If you want to find out what is available out there in Doctor Who in a vast... um, database of Doctor Who collectibles that is absolutely free to free to access. You need to get to Howe's Transcendental Boy Toy Box. And that's at DoctorWhoToyBox.co.uk. And of course, by Howe, we mean David J. Howe. A wonderful guy. A uh, great friend uh, and one of the best resources for collectors. Has one of the largest Doctor Who collections in the world. If you're looking, of course, for great Doctor Who items at great prices, look no further than DoctorWhoStore.com, not a sponsor of this podcast. Uh, That is owned by Alien Entertainment. And the reason why we talk about DoctorWhoStore.com is, uh, you remember earlier when I mentioned I sold bundles from Britain to my partner. Well, my partner was Gene Smith, and Gene Smith is the CEO of Alien Entertainment. So... (laughs) 
<laughs> obviously things went very well after that fact. Um, so anyway, lots of sales running, uh, lots of Target books, some hardcovers, lots of figurines. Um, if you live in the Chicago area or western suburbs, you can select free pickup from the Lombard location. Uh, and of course, uh, they've got two locations now, one in Lombard and one in Logan Square. So Visit AlienEntertainment.com for locations and store hours. Uh, you can also get some good items at Forbidden Planet, one of our sponsors. We are currently rehabbing our website. We had some trouble with some of the embed codes that they sent us from Forbidden Planet, but we're getting those fixed, and you can continue to shop. We've had quite a number of people who shopped at Forbidden Planet through us, so we thank you for that, and we'll get that open as soon as possible. Um, of course, our eBay store is open, and we've got some hardcover books. We've got some Target books. We've got uh, some other miscellaneous items, and of course, all the proceeds benefit the podcast. So, on our website at drwhocollectors.com, in addition to all the podcasts, we also have the complete guide to classic Doctor Who hardcover books. These are the books published from 1974 to 1988. Um, that were published in hardback, some with dust jackets, uh, some with printed laminate boards, um, and they all, uh, not every story made it to that level, but these are some of the most sought after books in the Doctor Who collecting world. Uh, as And we list some reprints that some collectors didn't even know existed, and we provide proof of life for a lot of those different things. Chicago TARDIS 2023, set for November Thanksgiving weekend, that's the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday after Thanksgiving. Join us for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who with this convention here in the Midwest. That's where I hang out, so you can come and say hello to me. Uh, for more information, of course, go to chicagotardis.com. And so far, we've got some guest announcements. Uh, officially on the guest list here, we've got Jason Haig Ellery. He's the CEO of Big Finish, a wonderful guy. Um, and of course, with your convention ticket, every convention ticket comes with Fraser Hines, who will be there. And of course, we're going to have the son of Patrick Troughton, Michael Troughton. He was scheduled last year, but had to cancel, but he's back on the list for this year. Uh, also, don't forget, hotel reservations sell out quickly, so get that if you're coming in from out of town. You don't want to miss this year's convention. So what else is going on with me? Well, uh, in very short time from the time this podcast airs, uh, on April 22nd, uh, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. at the Dirks Hall at the Milwaukee School of Engineering University, I am a guest at Consinity 2023, the Gathering of the Geeks. Uh, visit my table. I will have plenty of Doctor Who Target books, hardcover books, and some records and some other things. I have some goodies for sale. I'm also presenting, uh, hopefully, uh, it tend tentatively presenting my Doctor Who Collector Showcase. I haven't uh, really finalized that yet, but hopefully I will soon. And I noticed that my name was missing from the guest list on the last social media post. I'm sure that was an oversight, and we will get that corrected. Um, I did present a wonderful virtual session on Doctor Who games for Oricon 23. That video will be available on our Patreon site very soon at the $10 level. So you can just visit us at our Patreon site and at the early level, the lower level, you can see that video. Uh, I am very much confirmed to be a guest at Doctoberfest 2023. That's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and that's, I believe, October 21st. And I will have the, uh, the uh, Doctor Who Collector Showcase and Traveling Museum in a dedicated room. But I'm also extremely excited to announce that joining me on the guest list is none other than Sophie Aldred, who played Ace in the classic series and in Power of the Doctor. Uh, I contacted uh, Miss, Miss Sophie on Facebook recently, and she responded back. She's excited to be there as well, and um, looking forward to, to hanging out with her. So that will be fun. Uh, so don't miss this festival. Details on tickets will be coming very soon. So I will have that information here also on my website at DrWhoCollectors.com. And don't forget to like their Facebook page. That's Doctoberfest 2020. I will, of course, be back at Chicago TARDIS in November. Uh, I am also confirmed to be a guest at the Twin Cities console room in 2024 and uh, doing the Doctor Who Collector Showcase. And I am still tentative for uh, Gallifrey One in 2024. So watch this space for that. 
Uh, new to the collection, so this was a nice find. I uh, found a copy of the Wheel in Space in hardcover. New, ad new, a new condition. Not a library book, never been read. The binding is tight. It's a very nice edition. And I was able to secure a copy of the very first Radio Times cover from 1964 featuring the Dalek Invasion of Earth. I will have this on display, of course, at Consinity and Oktoberfest. So uh, very nice to have that cover along with the Tomb of the Cybermen cover that I recently got. So that's about it for that. Speaking of hardcover books, as I did before, um, rumors abound, of course, on, on books getting a second or third printing um, by people that said, yeah, maybe I, I think I had one of those, but I sold it. But we have no proof of some of these books existing. So I'm always on the lookout for concrete proof of existence of second print, third printing, even fourth printing. I don't think any fourth printings happened for the hardcovers. Um, but I, I only have one hardcover book with proof that it had a third printing, and that's Doctor Who and the Loch Ness Monster, and I have it in my collection. So it is very, very much uh, a real book. Uh, the first and second editions of Loch Ness Monster, very hard to find. Uh, so anyway, if you have a book that, you know, for instance, uh, Brain of Morbius, second printing, or Pyramids of Mars, second printing, um, I think I have that one maybe, but if you have a book that is a second printing for a hardcover, it says second impression, um, take some photos. Take a photo of the cover, the spine, uh, so we can see what the imprint is and the, and the title page, and that'll help us out in getting complete information for the collectors. And we're more than happy to include your name and hopefully get your permission to use them. Anyway, you can contact me for details at Podcast at gmail.com. Also, we love talking to collectors. Let's talk about your collection. And I don't mean in a bad way. Let's, let's hear what you, what's going on with you and how you're doing things. Do you keep your books in publication order or story order? Um, do you keep them in number order? I'm not sure why. Um, how do you have your figurines set up? Do you have a Dalek in your room? Let's, let's check this out. Give us, give us an email and let's get you on the show. On today's show, I am extremely excited about today's show because today I talk with Tasha Achilleos. She is the widow of the great Chris Achilleos, who did most of the artwork for the early Target books and the illustrations. Um, of course, many, many pieces of art over the years. And sadly, we lost Chris two years ago. Uh, and so I'm talking with her. We've got some very important uh, questions that are going to be answered here on this podcast. I have the exclusive interview uh, lined up. She is a wonderful lady, and uh, you're going to love this talk. And so you don't want to miss this conversation. So don't stop listening now. Keep that tuned. Keep us tuned in. Uh, and speaking, of course, um, if you're not familiar with Feedspot, Feedspot is a place where podcasts live. Uh, Doctor Who podcasts live there as well. And they do a ranking every year of the top 90 Doctor Who podcasts. And as of last year, uh, we were ranked number 33 of the top 90 of Doctor Who podcasts. Thank you so much. We're glad to make the list. I want to thank all our patrons out there. If you would like to see exclusive material, including the video interview with Tasha Achilleos, and I'll, and I'll explain this too. We had um, Zoom technical difficulties for over an hour, and I bless her heart. She kept going. She kept trying. We finally got it, and we finally had our conversation. Some guests would have given up at that point, and we wouldn't have had it, but um, we did figure out the problem, and we got it going. Uh, so that's a $15 or level above, and you can find it at patreon.com backslash Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. If you'd like to support us anywhere else, you've got a couple of options here. We are a Podbean podcast at doctorwhocollectors.podbean.com. Click the Become a Patron button and support us at any level. Or you can go to our website at doctorwhocollectors.com, click the Donate button, and submit a dollar amount of your choosing. We also accept Doctor Who items as, as, do, as donations. These are not tax deductible. But if you want to get rid of your Target books, if you want to get rid of your stuff and you don't want to go through the hassle of selling it, support the podcast. Because what we do is we sell the items and we take the money and we use it to pay our bills. We keep the microphones working, keep the website up and running, keep our, our uh, podcast hosting bills paid. That's about it. You know, we are a nonprofit podcast. We rely completely on donations and uh, subscriptions. Thank you so much.
Our theme song is Who's Doctor Who, composed by Barry Mason and Les Reed, performed by Fraser Hines. If you want to talk about this podcast with anybody, and we expect you to, of course, we are everywhere, pretty much. We're on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Podbean. I think the only place you will not find us is Spotify. And, of course, we're a Direction Point Network podcast. You can find us at directionpoint.org. We are going on a journey, a very long journey, through the world of the Target novelizations and publication order. Every week, we are looking at a new book, talking about Terrence Dix, Malcolm Hulk, and all our Doctor Who novelization friends. Whatever you do, keep turning the pages. This is Jason Miller of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast, a member of the Direction Point Podcast Network, and you are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Hi, I'm Juliet. And I'm Nathan. Experience Doctor Who from the very beginning through a classic fan's eyes. And through the eyes of a new Who fan. Reminisce and relive those classic moments with Nathan as he offers fun insight. Or experience them for the first time with Juliet as she dwells on social issues, history, fashion, and the size of a flashlight. We're the Time Streams Podcast. Find us on Spotify, Stitcher, or Apple Podcasts. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Are you ready to travel through time with us? Then check out Traveling the Vortex, a Doctor Who podcast. For nearly seven years and more than 500 episodes, we've traveled from one end of the vortex to the other, making different stops with different doctors, reviewing everything from TV stories to audio plays, from books to comics, and more. Sean, Keith, and Glenn take you on a journey through 50-plus years of Doctor Who episodes and spinoff materials. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, so be sure to check us out. And now, we're a proud member of Direction Point, a Doctor Who podcast network. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Up there is the scanner. Those are the doors. That is a chair with a panda on it. Sheer poetry, dear boy. And now it's time for our main story. In November of 2020, I received one of the best gifts I could ever receive. It was a lovely print of the cover of Day of the Daleks from my friend Chris Achilleos. Chris sadly passed away in December of 2021, and we actually had him scheduled on the podcast for February of 2022, which was one year ago. Going back in time, Terrence Dix and Malcolm Hulk may have written the first few Target books, but it was the captivating and amazing artwork that sold them. I bought my first Target book in 1981, and the cover is what drew me to that book. The Doctor Who world lost an icon and a good friend. But today, I'm joined by a very, very special guest. Tasha Achilleos is with me. Welcome, Tasha. Hello, Larry. It's good to see you. I hope you're well. I am, yeah. Got a well, slight I mean, a bit of a cold season over here, but, you know, been all right. Um, all okay. So, so you can see I've, I've kind of popped a few of the... The stuff up behind me as well. So I've got so, some, you know, some previous collections that my husband had too. So it's quite interesting going through some of the Doctor Who books that he's got. So that's been quite a little bit, little bit of a journey for me, really. And learning about the history as to how he got started is quite fascinating. Yeah, so, it yeah. is. Um, and and for me, uh, I started out very early. I've been I've been watching the show for forty eight years, and uh, of course, we didn't have Target books in the United States until nineteen eighty one. So that was the first year they came over. And in 1984, I opened up a store and I sold Target books and hardcover books. And of course, all the books that we could get and most of the early book, all the early books were drawn by Chris. And yeah. and he did quite and his artwork uh, probably is more famous than any artist that came after him in this whole uh, line of 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 of, of work, um, and I I'll go back. Here's the, this is the very first uh, hardcover book that came out. Of course, that's his drawing, and all his illustrations are inside here as well. Yeah, that's correct. Because when so, he first published, he did some of the drawings on the inside. Um, yeah. Pulled back from that, so uh, found them a bit too time consuming. I think so. I think that was why. 
I, I I can imagine that's a lot of work. And of course, uh, as as time as course of dead, as deadlines uh, came up, I'm sure he even felt the pressure to produce. And that's uh, that's when you start thinking, OK, this is no longer, you know, the the art is fun. But now it's like I've got a deadline and <laughs> I've got to get this cover done. Uh, but uh, what what really uh, made it uh, even more special is uh, when they they actually reprinted that book in 1981 <laughs> And Andrew Skilleter did the cover, but they kept all of Chris's illustrations inside the book. Okay. So I th- I thought of that as okay, we've got we've got a really good uh, we've got two great artists at work here. So of course Andrew Andrew's a listener, so he and he has great respect for Chris's work. I know. So that's yeah. one of the great things about it. So um, uh, let me let me just ask, uh, what tell me about your your journey and learning about Chris's work with Doctor Who. Well, I mean, I I was a Tom Baker fan. I was born in 1970, so he was my my doctor, and of course, he was the one that had the longest history, the longest program. Um, so uh, I got introduced to through that to Tom Tom Baker. Um, I was also a Blake Seven fan as well, so I was very much in part of the sci-fi stuff which was coming out in that in that particular day and age, all kind of British stuff, and that link between. Blake Seven and Doctor Who is still there as well. So there's a big link between British sci-fi history. Um, I really got introduced to Chris's artwork because I'm a Tolkien fan, a massive Tolkien fan. And, um, and of course, I read the books when I was about nine, ten years old and just wandered into a poster shop one day and came across the host of Kess. And that was my first, first, that was my introduction to his art. Mm. Uh, and I didn't even know he was in London I kind of came up, I left, um, you know, the, uh, I, you know, the Isle of Wight, uh, came up to London to study, do a degree, and then ended up going down this club in London. Um, and that's where I met him. So through friends and through mutual friends, I knew him for about 15 years. Um, and then obviously time kind of went by and I told him about my talking thing probably about two years before we actually started to go out with each other. Yeah. Uh, and then that was the link. So obviously we then... We then kind of played a little bit more. We understood that a bit of his artwork on my wall when I was about 17, 18 years old. Um, so um, that connection was there. His Doctor Who artwork, I became a lot more fascinated in terms of his Doctor Who artwork through the conventions that we did together. Mm-hmm. So I got to meet people. I got to meet the fans. I got to meet the Dwarves community. I got to meet everybody who, who really was the inspiration behind what he did. Um, so his inspiration, he was very young. Mm-hmm. He, worked for, um, he worked for Brian Bowl, Boyle, which is where he got his first um, artwork through. And um, he, he got his job offer through college, really, and just went around and asked to do book covers, and this is how he got introduced to Brian Bowl. Um, and that's where he got the first reprints mm. of the ones which he issued in the 1960s, and then they were reprinted again in 1973, I believe. That was yes. his- um, and then from that, obviously, they did very well. 20,000 copies were sold. And that was his progression with that. But he's obviously his um, influences, as we know, were Bellamy, who was doing a Radio 2 covers at the time. And he was Hero Spartans, all the centrefolds from that. And he learned to speak English through his work, through the Eagle. Mm. And this is how he came to England. And this is how he interpreted, how he learned our language, is through the little comics and he wanted to know what was being said in the speech bubbles. Mm-hmm. And um, this is how, so he learned from Bellamy. Bellamy was a major influence for him, absolutely huge. And obviously, Conan was too, with the clack, as we know, the controversial clack. Yes, yes, clack. I know, I, I I didn't grab that book off my shelf, but that has been my favorite uh uh, I I actually started that Twitter hashtag a few years ago, hashtag clack as as the and and of course I kept it on my on my Facebook page for a while just in honor of 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 Chris because I think that and of course I have both of his uh art books that he did, uh both in hardcover and paperback. Yeah, that's uh I did I am not sure why I didn't grab those off the shelf, but that's uh, you know, you probably have one right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as we know, also I got his, his awards for the for his outstanding contributions, Doctor Who, which was given to him last year by the Dwes community. Yes. An absolute, you know, honour actually for me to go down and get that. I was invited, and I just 
I think it's about three months till it's April, about four months after she passed away. So it was a big thing for me as well to kind of go down there and interact with all these lovely people that I got to meet through him for the 10 years, which is the Doctor Who community. And um, so, so the interpretation of Clack um, over here was really his kind of yes. his final exclamation mark to his career with Doctor Who. Um, and, um, and of course, the testimonials when we were doing the conventions. It was so lovely, the stories which I got told. Well, I just listened, I just spoke to loads of I spoke to loads of fans, lovely people. And, um, and just kind of hearing the stories between the, how they, the childhood and how the, what the book covers meant to them. And I turned around to him when we were doing, I think it was the Capitol. And I turned around to him and I said to him, um, I think it might be like all these stories I keep hearing about how important your art was, was to people and how it got them through some difficult points in their life. And I said, I think we need to make that connection. So I came up with the idea of adding the testimonials into the back. Yeah. And then Vaughan Russell, who's a lovely guy from Candy Jar Publishing, we just spoke about it. Chris then raised it, had a little phone call. And then said, oh, you know, Tasha's come up with this idea about testimonials. That was then taken on board. Sean then took it over and took over all the testimonials and that was published in the back of the clack. So that was my integration into the world of Doctor Who was um, and understanding his role and what he meant to people because he was so humble. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And such a lovely man. I, I think his influence about what, what he did with his artwork resonated with him. And I think he was a cultural icon. He's a cultural icon. And he changed art and interpretation of uh, comic book designs for book covers at that time. That was what he did. Mm -hmm. And obviously he took his own interpretation of Kirby this week. I'm going to see if I can reach this here without extending yeah. my headphones okay. here, because I think that is one of the most important uh, covers that what what you were saying, the most important cover that he did to influence that, of course, was the invasion of the dinosaur dinosaur invasion and um where Kaklak was born. <laughs> and this is the you know and uh that that is one of my favorite covers. I mean it's it's uh it's and for and for the fact that the book actually is a better it's a better story than what they did on screen. <laughs> <laughs> It's old, yeah. You know, there's wonderful dinosaurs wandering around. And of course, when we, well, I met Stuart Manning also uh, at the um, Space Centre. Yes. So everybody kind of came together and they're all Doctor Who's, and everybody was wandering around and, you know, Cybermen. It was quite scary, all these, you know, the old the old version of Cyber, which came across to the Peter Capaldi. I love, I love Peter Capaldi as well. I loved his Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when they're all kind of wandering around with all the, they're all there. It was a bit scary. Was scary. Mm -hmm. And you meet the Starman Legion, you know, there's all these people that, you know, the Daleks, you know, the Sons of Scars. It's lovely. All these people kind of get together. So that's how I got really introduced to Doctor Who, the artwork of Doctor Who. And then also I met Colin Howard and Alistair Pearson and. And you Skinner, who are also really lovely people. And it's just a lovely family. They all kind of bounce off each other very well. Oh yeah. I, I um uh, I, I, I speak with Andrew quite a bit and he just has nothing but high praise for, for Chris's work. Of course, he started the the whole thing with the early books. And uh you were talking about Cyberman. This is one of my favorite drawings he did of a Cyberman. Um yeah. which uh and unfortunately it's only on the first edition of this book. Oh, okay. So when they reprinted it, they didn't use his artwork again. So yeah. it's it's quite uh, and of course his uh, you were talking Tom Baker. This is one of my favorite Tom Bakers he did for the making of Doctor Who. He did this yeah. cover. Uh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful work. Of course, the book, the first book I bought uh, was was Day of the Daleks, and uh, that's the uh, I have it right here. This is the print he sent me. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, with with his uh, his he he says here to Larry and the Doctor Who Collectors podcast, your friend Chris, and wow. and signed it. And then he also included um, this wonderful uh, bookmark uh, with with his mark on the back. Yeah, so that was that was really kind. He was he was yeah. su always super nice. Yeah. Um, but I, I did want to show you too that uh, not uh, when when the book got published in some other countries. They didn't want to pay for the artwork. Okay. So I've got a copy of a book here from uh, 
port from Brazil. You're going to love this. This is somebody attempting to copy the artwork. Uh I've never seen that before. I wonder if Chris was probably not aware of those things, but then, you know, you'll just brush that off as just a bit of a... Yeah, I always I always wanted to show this to him, but it never it never came up. Uh, but uh, I, I've only had this book for a few months, and uh, I didn't know that Doctor Who was licensed uh, over there. So they got the license for the book. It's in Portuguese, but uh, and this was from 1975, by the way. So uh, so that basically he they did not want to pay for the cover. Uh, so they they drew their own and it's terrible. I mean, I, I'll, I'll hold it up so you can see it more detailed. But it's it's a hor it's horrible. The Daleks are bad. The, that's the wrong doctor, and the Ogron looks terrible. Uh, whereas you know Chris's detail here, the Daleks are perfect. He draws he draws the best Daleks. Um, and John and he always drew John Pertwee exactly the way John looked. Uh, his doctors were were very much on uh, and. The the one that John Pertwee liked uh, was was this cover. Oh yeah, it's, yes, it's a really good um, sketch and likeness of John Pertwee. Because uh, when I was at uh, I was a, I was a dealer at Tardis Twenty Two in Chicago in nineteen eighty five, and on Saturday morning uh, when the doors opened, John Pertwee came into the room and walked up to our table and he picked up this book and he said, "This is my favorite." Oh, lovely. <laughs> You know, because Chris, there's a bit of indication around the size of the nose that Chris had to kind of sort out a little bit with the Pertwee family. So he, he would have been quite, you know, pleased to know that. Yeah, <laughs> John, because yeah, uh, we had all these books on our table and John picked up this one and said this was his favorite. He liked oh. the he likes the expression on his face. He likes the the whole. You know, he was very very pleased, and uh, that's that's something you probably you probably don't get to hear much because that you know John is no longer with us as well. Um, Chris's artwork did appear on the German editions of books. This is a German book here. Oh, ask me some questions around that, yeah, because I've just kind of gone the the Dune Dark Van Figures, no one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the uh, the the German Daily Dogs, and uh, of course, and you probably saw, and I know you saw on Instagram. I have a complete copy of the Turkish books as yeah. well, uh, yeah. and and all of his artwork, uh, including his first, uh, the first one, one of my also also favorites, the Doctor Who and the Daleks cover, with a wonderful William Hartnell, and you know he uh, all the. Uh, all the wonderful, wonderful copies that he did. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really nice is that, uh, I don't know if this, this project never got off the ground, but they were going to reprint uh, the Target books. It was called the Target Book Collection. And they did seven of these. This is one of seven yeah. copies. These fine hard covers. Yeah. Some it's got it's got Chris's original artwork with the Target logo on the on the book, but there's also a, a reversible dust jacket with somebody else's artwork, which I thought, well, I'd, I'd rather have his artwork than somebody else's. But that's um, but that was how that worked. Also, um, Chris's artwork got into a lot of other things too. I don't know if you've ever seen this. No, I okay. Haven't. This is a this is a brochure from the Lionheart Television Company, which was Hi. which was a part of the BBC back in 1980, and their job. This is what they sent to the United States to Hi. to buy the Doctor Who. It says basically that we're offering 172 half hours uh, full or 41 full length movies for your television station to buy. Doctor Who. So um, this is uh, they actually took this cover from uh, yeah. the yeah, second the, the second monster book, yeah, which is this one here. So they they use the exact artwork from that. I don't know if they got permission to do that. I have I'm guessing maybe they did, and maybe maybe he signed something and you know said ah, okay. Who knows? I don't know. Sometimes things happen without that whole uh because this was the bbc this was not target and basically it just it has all the descriptions of all the tom baker stories that okay. and of course my television station here in chicago bought all of them so, okay so we got doctor who as a result i managed to get a hold of uh and so it has the little lion heart logo on the back there and some of the pictures they used and uh so this was this was uh, and of course Do doctor who's been in in chicago since 1975 i started uh 
when I was really young. Uh, we're only a year apart, by the way. So that's I was born in '69. So that's uh, so I started watching John Pertwee uh, in 1975, and then they got the Tom Bakers in 1979. But we didn't we didn't get the books until 1981. Yeah. I I met I met Chris at. I believe it was a visions convention uh, in the nineties. I know uh, Gene Smith had invited him over um, at least for one. I don't know if you were with him at the time. I, I probably not. I, well, I would have remembered, uh, but, but I remember how, how kind he was and how, um, you know, he was always kind to the fans and not every doctor who personality is kind to the fans. I mean, that's, that's really something I've, I've been lucky with, um, you know, I had uh, about two weeks ago, I had Peter Purvis on the podcast who played Steven in the with the first doctor. And he was extremely kind and just really, really loved what he did. Um, recently, I know they reprinted all the Target books. And so um, they, of course, put Chris's artwork on the on the reprints. So they went back to the basics to what I what I call just the, the amazing art that that he did. Here's the, the Crusaders. Uh but it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. He um, also, let's see. Right yes, I think he was quite um, pleased when they approached him to ask to three other book covers. Yeah, the Doctor Who, yeah, the amazing one, yeah. Doctor Who. Yeah, that was all the PG tips, wasn't it? Or Thai food, Thai food. Thai food uh, tea, right, yes. Uh, and uh, I have I, I have the book, the poster, and all the cards, So okay. which, which you couldn't get in the United States. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Because you buy quite a few flexible items, don't you? I yeah, I, I've been I've been collecting for forty eight years, so uh, that's uh, you can see around me just everything that's here. It's 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 all Doctor Who in the room here. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, what I wanted to say was uh, I had Sadie Miller on the program, and she's the daughter of Elizabeth Sladen, and this is one of the few times Chris drew Elizabeth Sladen because most of the time on some of the books you only get to see her from the back. So uh, the the one the one book I was thinking of here, if I can find it here, yeah, it's uh, Planet of the Spiders. Uh, you only get to see Sarah from the back, <laughs> and but uh, that's another great John Pertwee. This is another Chris uh, drawing. Uh, the other one I like. Uh, this one I just got, but uh, the Ark in Space. Yeah. He did with the with the Weirin. Uh, that that's always good. Uh, he drew some of the and. This is actually another good one too. Planet of the Daleks was always a, a good one of his. Just the the, the detail. It's, yeah. it's just the, the detail is what, um, and of course the uh, nobody drew Davros like Chris did. I mean, I, I think that is one of the one of the best book covers in terms of Doctor Who that ever, and his um, the one that he did for Del Santos, which is the commission. Yes. That, yes. Can I say names on this thing? Can I say yes. that Del <laughs> uh, Yeah, obviously had the commission, which was the invasion of the Earth, which was the second one. So the other one came from the invasion of, she says, Todd Book Cover, and this was the second one, where the Daleks going across Westminster Bridge. I think that's outstanding. Oh, yes. Uh, that's this this one right here. Uh, oh, Dalek invasion of Earth. Uh, it's it's. I love the Dalek on fire here, and the, uh, the the detail of the spaceship with Big Ben in the background. Yeah, he he did. Yeah, gosh, you know, it's. Um, and at the, I'm sure at the time this was a job, <laughs> and uh, you know he didn't think that this was going to be anything uh, years later. But uh, of course, um, I know that. You know, people are at least when I when I when I uh, get my social media contacts on there, they're always trying, oh, here's my Chris Achilles poster. Here's the here's here's what I got from this. This is my my I've got the original artwork to this book that I got from him. And and, and it's just everybody's so excited about that exactly. that artwork. Yeah, because I mean, he did it. He, you know, he kind of came out and got the free reprints done, didn't he, free Brian Bowl. Um, and then and then they they worked uh, quite successful. And uh, I think it was Hens, was it Hensworth or something? It was the director who formed Target Books at the time or something. I can't remember his name. Um, yes. And then obviously inquired about another load of books being done. So they approached Frank Bellamy and he couldn't do it. So then Chris kind of took those on board as well. And then obviously the, the next load of Target Books were released onto the market. He was still really young at the time. He was only 24. And so his interpretation of his own influences from Kirby and, mm. uh, 
Act, um, which is a comic book, um, and also the you know the you know the Bellamy connection. Oh yes, uh, I, I don't know if you can see over here in this corner here. That is original uh, Frank Bellamy artwork. Oh my god! Uh, that's from the cover of the 1972 Radio Times. Wow, that uh, is. I'm, I managed to get a hold of that. I've got the actual Radio Times in my collection too from 1972. It's got the Daleks on the cover and the yeah Frank Bellamy. Oh gosh, amazing! So that's the direct circular influence that Chris that inspired Chris to do the books. And that, you know, that comedy, that comic um, snapshot, that, you know, that, you know, this little kind of, um, you know, the blazing of colours that he does. And the yes, little, yes. I did the dots with the blazing colours in the background. But it's just quite interesting as you notice his kind of, as he moves through and he learns a little bit more about, about how to do book covers. And his style changes quite a lot as they kind of go through. It's quite interesting. They do. Um, they 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 kind of go through another cover that I really love is the Doomsday Weapon. Yeah. Which, yeah. which right. and he's yeah. got Roger Delgado on there and uh just the the uh the alien in the background in a different cover and and just making that cover just come alive. And of course, uh, I know Tar this was 1974. Um the um let's see, the other one, uh the Sea Devils, which yeah. uh his original cover for the sea devils, they changed it when they reprinted, but uh, this one with, with uh, Katie Manning on the front cover and the, and the two sea devils, this book became super popular when legend of the sea devils uh, yeah. aired on TV. Everybody wanted to get a copy of the original book. So people were asking me, where can I find an original copy of the sea devils? I said, well, I, you know, I own one, but I'm not selling it. It's, my, no, it's a beautiful well, copy. But, well, yeah. It's simply amazing to see, you know, that that some of the new stuff that's happening is getting people interested in what, you know, what happened. And of course, you know, um, yeah. you know, for for me uh, as a you know longtime Doctor Who fan, it's it was just a, a really big deal that I that I have some artwork by Chris and I have things that, you know, that mean a lot to me because it's personalized too. It's uh, you know, he and I, he and I, you know, became Facebook friends a few years ago, and we exchanged some great messages, and uh, we were one, just wonderful in that. And um, you know, while while I'm there, I, I also want to thank you for inviting me to his funeral. Uh, I I was I was able to watch it live, uh, and I I was very moved, and I, I of course never have seen a Dalek honor guard before. Oh, that was the sons. I got, again, can I mention names? So yes, that was yes. Yeah, so that was Robert Cowley and his wife, um, and obviously I I kind of contacted them because I I love Robert Cowley. I, I meet him and met him at many different shows and talked to his wife many times, and just the Daleks and they're kind of fascinated with the build of the Daleks and how they're going to get the charity event for getting all the Daleks together at one time. I think that's amazing. But um, and so of course I contacted him. Like we we. It was kind of COVID 2021. Everybody was still feeling a little bit anxious about getting together in groups and masses. Um, my pla my my first interpretation was to get a whole legion of Daleks. <laughs> now that would have been great. <laughs> Marching in front of the the hearse, but obviously um, I had a little chat to Robert Cowley about it. He was able to bring down two Daleks with his mm -hmm. wife. So. That yeah, that photograph where, where you know the hearse is coming forwards and the two darts on the side. It's just it meant so much to me mm -hmm. having them, and it meant a lot to them being there as well. And I got when we kind of came through the darts, just kind of came through. It, it said it, it was it meant it 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 meant something. It meant something to me and to the community and that kind of connection again, which is a connection that I we kind of spoke a lot about with CLAC, which is the development of CLAC was this kind of integration of what people who we met through his artwork, that he met and then I met, and I got to know as well. They became friends of mine too. And, and that connection between the fans and the artwork, because for him it was just a job at the beginning. Right. right. You, you know, he got married quite young, was, you know, had two daughters, you know, bought them up quite, quite, quite so. So, of course, his deadline, he knew what he wanted to do, which is book covers, which is why the storyboard connection of doing all the drawings inside the books got pulled out quite quickly because he didn't want to do that kind of work. Um, uh, so my my kind of towards his end, when he was still creating a few paintings, you know, he did three more for Clack. Um, and then obviously the three more, when they approached him to do the extra book covers for the battlefield, um, 
you know, the and the ones with the you know the controversial news one that you already taken yes. off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, I think he was very pleased to still be embedded as part of the Doctor Who community. I think he was pleased to be asked, and he enjoyed doing it, and he very much enjoyed doing Clack. Yes. Uh, Russell is a wonderful publisher, and he was able to get the best out of Chris. And Chris is obviously knew his art extraordinarily well. Um, he knew what he what 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 he what it was about. He knew what his message was about, and Sean did too because Sean's a major fan of Doctor Who. And um, we kind of met at one of the tar- ca- Cardiff um, cons. It was just this little tiny convention that he got invited to. Um, and there was Sean Russell stood on the left-hand side. And so we just kind of approached him, connected. He connected, found out it was a publisher. And that's how Platt kind of started off. Oh. Um, and that to, for him to have all his Doctor Who stuff in one place was just... He, he drew everything in my hands, I've got to be saying. Yes. Okay? yes. Every little sketch, even the books, if you had to design something, they were tiny sketches of the bigger paintings. So mm-hmm. there was a bigger painting and then a tiny one that he was going to embed in the book. He did everything by hand. He was just, yeah. he never did anything on the computer. He was just really quite a pure artist, I think, because largely he couldn't get his head around the technology. And he just didn't feel as he had the time. He wanted to stay as pure as he could. He was regular at it. Um, so, so, you know, that connection with him being able to draw things out. And he was very good at publishing books too. Sarah's was almost self-published, obviously published through something else, but he created it himself. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole design with all these little pencil sketches in his in, in his kind of phototype for Sirens, where he's literally drawn the whole book out. Amazing. I mean, that, how incredible is that? That's you know, amazing. I did the same with Clap. So um, these kind of little kind of sketches in there and these little kind of drawings that he always put into there. So um, I was going to say very quickly as well, because obviously um, this is this – is, this is going to be reprinted. Um, both myself and Esther and Anna, his two daughters, um, are working with Sean Russell to get this reprinted. It's going to come out again in April. And there's going to be a slight bit of changes in the back. There's going to be um, some testimonials from his family um, and also from myself um, to just to kind of provide an exclamation mark towards his career. So and what 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 I kind of realised about the people that I met and how important his art was to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um and so it's gonna be republished in April, um, just as a retail, just as just as a paperback. And okay. then get it out again so it'll be done again. There'll be a few slight changes in there. So um I hope people like the reprint and hopefully we'll get it out and advertise it and get some links out there and that's coming through Sean Russell again as well in class, so it's coming out. Um and um yeah, so you know, and of course, doing Clack got him behind the drawing board again. So I saw him draw during, during my during my marriage and during my life with him. I saw him draw six Doctor Who back paintings, all from scratch right up until the end of fruition. And it was wow. a kind of process to see him do it. And so it was just a sketch, and then obviously reference sketches, and then two days later it didn't look like much, and then two days later you walked in, it was like, how how, how, how did you do that? It, it was. It was actually this kind of, you know, process of watching him create and bring things together. He was really good at concepts and conceptual design. He knew how to make something pop on a page. And that was his skill level. And it was such a skill level. He understood the market so well. He understood himself. What inspired him and made him turn to sketching. He came from Cyprus. He didn't draw in Cyprus. And he started when he came here. And um, obviously showed an extraordinary flair for eye to hand coordination and and all the mythology and history fascinated him. Um, so he kind of arrives in, in the country around about the time that all the sci-fi stuff was kind of taking off and the comic books. And this is where, where he got introduced to comics and that inspired his uncle Kirby, um, which he met him. And Kirby actually walked up to him in a convention and said, hello, you're Chris... I really like your work. And for Chris, it's kind of like, oh, my God, Jack Kirby, you're one of my idols. So, <laughs> all, um, you know, I love how our artwork circulates around and the influences of his influences and that, and that kind of connection. Um, and I love the fans. The fans are actually the most important part because they keep it alive. They, yeah. they, they're the ones who keep it alive. And they're the ones who put extraordinarily well to Doctor Who. I didn't realise how precious it was. And I didn't realise how important it was until I started talking to people. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very pleased to be considered as a part of that family, Doctor Who. It means so much to me um, because because through him, through him being an artist, and understanding him as an artist, it was he was a commercial artist. Um, he just you know, um, but that but that but that emotional connection between what his art meant to fans out there and what he did really meant a lot to him and the Doctor Who world meant quite a lot to him. He, he enjoyed the connection. He enjoyed the artists. He enjoyed talking to other artists. He enjoyed being inspired by other artists. And he, and he worked hard and he deserved all the accolades that he, he, he got and he will still get um, because he was an extraordinarily good mm. artist. He was, he was very humble. As a, as a person that you, you know, as an artist and person you live with, he, it, it, it never went to his head, uh, you know. He was just, he was just a man who enjoyed going out with his friends, his family, and you know, really just kind of like took the best out of life that he could, and had this amazing, ed, you know, this kind of amazing um, way of living and looking at life. So he was very calm in his approach. I think he learnt that because he was an artist. Mm. This, thing of actually bringing down small bits of information and making something big, locked in a room by yourself, just listening to, to a radio, um, it made him quite a patient man, I think. And this is how his interpretation of the world and everything that he had around it. He was very patient, man. Very humble. Wow. Yeah. Okay, and so my, my big question, or the big question that is uh, on everybody's minds here, will, will Chris's art be available again? Will the yeah, shop so reopen? Yeah, so um, yeah, so it's going to change because obviously Esther, Esther and Anna mm -hmm. um, are taking uh, some of the imagery at the moment. Um, they are currently building a website with a new shop. That 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 will take quite some time to come out. Sure, obviously, um, but they are selling some of the imagery through a platform right now. So they're trying to get as much of his artwork out as they can. Um, right now um obviously you know kind of restarting a business understanding right um, what the artwork is is you know is part of their journey as well to kind of get his artwork out too so um but yes good it, it will <laughs> and it's going to come through his daughters so um uh so yes they're going they're starting to get some of the platforms out there that they have not the doctor who stuff yet but they've got all the, you know, they've got all the backgrounds and the information, and mm. Bill Russell's still around to, to, you know, to help me out as well. Maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything like that, you know. Um, and this lovely world of Doctor Who that just kind of comes and supports each other. So um, yes, they they're going to get all the target stuff back out there again, and so they're going to start working with some other merchandising out there again. It may take a little bit of time, but it will get out there. Yes, definitely. Wonderful, and wonderful. So, who stuff will be available uh through his daughters so um um yeah so so yeah i think they're just kind of just trying to get their heads around <laughs> oh, you actually don't um and just i'm just kind of working out how the best way to kind of get it out there and stuff like that but it's actually out there now but i think the doctor who stuff isn't quite there yet but it will be it's going to be there that's great because I know uh, I know that once they get that going, it will sell probably even more than it did before. Because, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, uh, that'll be wonderful because uh, getting getting his art. I mean, his artwork is going to be out there whether it's you know sold or not because it's still being displayed. Um, I mean, I'll I'll you know when I when I do my daily troll through social media, there's at least five Chris Achilles pictures that come up either through somebody putting a target book up there or putting a print up there or something else that he did uh and and part of that world and it's it's one of the most important uh i mean i i consider him to be one of the most important artists in the series because if it hadn't been for his artwork they wouldn't have sold a target book no i i mean the twenty thousand copies that flew off the shelves with the reprints really indicated a lot about the cover art um nice. Kind of motivated from the 1960s and just kind of gave it a pop in the 1970s that everybody was. I mean, I mean, I think you know the 1970s, 1973. I don't know. I was only three years old, but I think it wasn't a good, particularly a good, positive decade. It was a bit of a, a yeah. hard 
Go through. So those lovely things, there you go. Yeah, this was uh, a Doctor Who magazine that came out a few uh, not long ago. Uh, special on Target books featuring Chris's art on the cover and a lot of a lot of his art in the in the magazine. So this was uh, let's see, I can't see the the date on this, but uh, it's okay. But it came out not long ago, and so it's still relevant. And of course. Um, uh, my good friend David J. Howe, of course, used Chris's artwork on the front cover of the Target book. I've got a couple of Howe's books, yeah. 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 So, of course, and I know David, David and I talk quite a bit. So he, he's, uh, you know, just just uh, just the um, one of the places where you could just open open the book and see all of Chris's covers in, in, in full in full color. And there's even, a, you know, they've got a, a little story about him in here and all, all the wonderful things that, yeah, here it is right here, the, uh, the, uh, the Chris Achilles page here where he gets uh, a big mention of, of what he did. And that's so, it's so nice that that history keeps going. And I, I yes. and like, and uh, that you're now part of that history. I am part of that history. And um, yeah, and, you know, I'm now, Doing the conventions with him was lovely, and the people it was just lovely. The people that we met was just were just fantastic, and the doctor who once really shone. Um, I mean, how as well kind of helped him with his calendar. So that 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 circulation of uh, the inspiration when he was talking about how do I set up the concept of my of the front page of my calendar, the Doctor Who calendar, and he found David Howe and had that chat. And so he's in, his influence as part of the character as well. So, you know, this lovely amalgamation of inspiration and, you know, influence and how we all fans that became collectors mm -hmm. and then and then audio voices and verbal representations of the world that we know. And it's lovely. You can, it's very open, open hearted. And everybody talks about it with uh massive amount of respect and, and I think he was so I don't think I understood when he first did the book I was just what how big it would be and just how heartfelt it all is and how important it was to some of the people back kids back there and now of course they're out <laughs> and they're still walking around <laughs> still very, you know the not too fans like you know people that I know if I, if I look at their Facebook feed they're watching reruns of the same Doctor Who programme 150 times over and it doesn't really matter how many times they watch it and I'm just like that's that, that's massive it's huge it's mm huge -hmm. Yeah, I noticed uh, when I when I talk to other actors who come to Doctor Who after doing other shows, and I said, "So, how many conventions did you do for that other show?" None. <laughs> uh, Tozen Cole, who I've talked to at a convention, he goes, "I was not prepared for." Doctor Who. In fact, when I got the part, uh, other actors called me and said, here, let me prepare you because <laughs> this is a different world. Uh, and, you know, and some of, and, and it's just, uh, you know, it's something that, I mean, this is, uh, and right now I'm, I've been asked to be part of a, a documentary uh, that they're doing for the 60th anniversary uh, for fans. And oh. it's, it's, it's almost more than what the Star Trek fans were going through back in the, in the late early seventies, late eighties, when, you know, that was their world, that's a little bit lesser, but now the doctor who world where people spend months recreating their, the, the costumes or recreating the, uh, recreating a, uh, a, you know, a yeah. piece of art or a prop or, or coming up with the, I mean, I, I just spoke to, I just spoke to Tim Traylor who now voices John Pertwee for big finish and he's never met John Pertwee, but but he studied him, you know, in film and said, you know, I, I I came up with this voice doing something for something else. And Tom Baker stopped him and said, you sound just like John. <laughs> and that's how we got the part was okay. Tom, Tom Baker was like, because Tom and John were very good friends. And he says, I've always heard, you know, you sound just like John Pertwee. So it's and of course, now we've got the children of Doctor Who stars like Daisy Ashford and Sadie Miller playing their moms. Yeah. You know, Carol and John and 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 uh, and Liz Sladen on Big Finish. So it's it's becoming a a, a multi generational. Uh, even even like Peter Purvis, who told me that he's got more work now as a Doctor Who actor, and he was only on the show for forty six episodes. 
in the 60s. And when he got fired, he forgot about Doctor Who and went on to do something else. And now it now it's paying for his retirement. Or hey. William or William Russell, who's 98 years old and still flying to California every year to be at Gallifrey One. Yeah. You know that <laughs> And I know you've been you've been to LA a few times. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, then we did Gallifrey beginning of 2018, um, and so, so I think it's about February 2018 we did uh, that. Yeah, and obviously David, David, I think David Howe was there at the time. Other people, Keith Barnfather, who does all the yes, uh, Keith, yeah. uh, videos. That really, unfortunately, he was. We, we were talking to him down at the Capitol, and he was just about he was going to do Chris, and unfortunately, never never got around to just uh, just ah, uh, I don't know yeah. why really happened no something didn't come into didn't make it into something that never happened which was you know a bit, bit of a shame at the end of it didn't get Chris on with making back you know um so all these all these you, you meet the same faces again <laughs> again and you meet the same people and it's a family it's a family it's yes. a community. and in this outpouring of uh, and yeah you kind of talk to these lovely exuberant young people who come to used to come to the the, the stall when he was selling and of course I ended up going ah. <laughs> and you know just these and this understanding of the the, the 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 passion the detail that they know about every episode and I they're going I, I'm learning from you yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm history of, from you on board and taking some of these it's taking what the what you how you feel about the show and now I'm sitting here learning about the show from you you know so yeah it's you know, it's this big big pot of lovely information and just yeah. Uh, you probably never seen this either, but this is uh, this is the this is a program from the very first American Doctor Who convention in 1979 and this is all of Chris's artwork. Wow. And uh, this is from uh, Los Angeles, uh, Corona, Los Angeles, presented by TV 52. Uh, and, and of course, uh, getting together to sell Doctor Who episodes to the rest of the country. That's so crazy. it's it's something how, you know, and, and things like this. I don't I doubt Chris has ever seen this document. So it's, I, it's 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 never been it's never it would never have any reason to go back to England. So it was one of those things. But his his reach was was far. He was far reaching. And his, you know, his, when he put pen to paper, you know, he probably at the time, no idea that the magic this was going to create decades later. And now we're in the 60th anniversary year of the program and everybody is, you know, this is a big year for Doctor Who. And we've got, you know, the, a new we got a new story airing with David Tennant as the Doctor. We've got, uh, you know. Uh, and Neil Patrick Harris, of course, from America. So we've got him in there. We've got uh, every convention that's happening this year has got more yeah. stars than anybody else. And uh, I guess the exhibition is going to reopen this year. The in England, they're going to reopen the Doctor Who exhibition for the, for the anniversary. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, that's that's something that is is going on. And of course, Doctor Who items are selling at a premium right now. It's uh, you know, yeah. It's uh, I mean, I, I showed you a copy of uh, Planet of the Daleks. Uh, a, a a copy of this book on eBay about six months ago sold for twenty six hundred dollars. Two thousand six hundred dollars. I know, and it, because it was a first printing, it was uh, it was it, it was in new condition, and I mean the book retailed at like three pound twenty back in seventy five. You know, it, it but it's uh, pe collectors are are really looking for these early early items, and uh, you know I've I think I think the oldest thing I have is uh, nineteen. I've got some things from nineteen sixty four in here, but uh, it's it's. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I don't I don't go crazy, but <laughs> but it's it's fun to to get. Uh, like I said, this this book, this book collection I, I got, it was all shrink wrapped together. These are all Target books that came out recently. And no one could tell me that I, it looks like some bookstore did this. It wasn't an official release. So that was something different. And, and, and of course, the uh, the Brazilian. uh the Brazilian yeah. book that had the uh, the 
the fake artwork on it. And that's, you know, I'll put that up again just so listeners can see, the viewers can see that one. This is somebody trying to copy Chris Achilles and not being very successful. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is the only, and, and so some of the covers were, I'm like, why didn't they just, I mean, just use the use the original cover and the the uh, the covers are so iconic and so wonderful and um, I'm trying to think the uh, the original monster book is still one of my favorites yeah. that no. he did. Yeah. So Chris has got two copies of the second monster book. Yeah. I, I, I never I never understood why the second monster book was so tiny. <laughs> It's tiny. It's too tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's this is the first one, and then the second one was was kind of small. So um, I I know that these and these are targets, but this this was a and I, I did an episode on these a while back where these are just the the filler books. They were the marketing was going so well that we just needed to put out more Doctor Who, and and especially in the uh, after uh, you know when they did the Three Doctors in 1973, they actually thought that was going to be the last season of Doctor Who. They were going to cancel the show, but then everything started to pick up in that tenth year. And they said, because most shows don't last ten years, that was the the rule. You know, BBC said ten years, we're good. So to have a show last sixty years, even though it went off the air for a little while, it did, it never stopped. Um, when when uh, I remember in '96 when we got the Doctor Who movie with Paul McGann, we were just, oh yeah, yeah, let's, let's, it, I mean, it wasn't very good, but it was still Doctor Who. And then uh, that, that moment uh, when, when the radio times came out in 2005 with the TARDIS on the cover and you had to unfold it to see Christopher Eccleston mm. and completely rebooting the series again. And of course, since then it's been, you know, since 2005, we've had a season every year since yeah. then. Yeah. So they've been back on, yeah, obviously yeah. season more fat. Gary Russell, who I've met a few times, he's lovely. Um, yeah, so they're, you know, they're all integrated, they're all fans too. So I think Gary's a fan. So as well, uh, you know, so yeah, that, <laughs> that child experiences. He was part, um, of course, he was sticking the famous five, too, wasn't he? Okay. And uh, as you know, so, um, you know, so yeah, that kind of childhood experiences and coming into adults and writing and, and you know, the creativity of getting all that stuff on the page and Chris was part of the visual and Gary Russell was part of the visual and they, they all started as kids kind of kind of you know either working in childhood imagination or BBC or production or direction so so got it so got instructions to that side of the world and then obviously like that for that became part of their career so yeah you can see it's fascinating it is fascinating how many little pieces kind of come together everybody's got kind of got this role to play and keeps it ongoing and this myth that it's become absolutely yeah. and that's yeah. that and that's just the best part about uh the leg the legacy of of chris achilleos will will last forever and that's um that i think i think for for many people that that is something you don't think about when you're when you're alive and when you know when all the people you know you you really know who your friends and admirers are after you're gone and and know that it's not about you know well you know that we're still talking about him i still i i still i, I still think of the memories i had of meeting him and talking with him and 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 I still I have his, his he is around me all the time you know this this is all around me here and I thought what a wonderful um, opportunity and I'm glad you and I became good friends as well that 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 was that was a, a bonus for for me because I, I really uh, I really love um, you know I I do love talking about it this is what I do I I started this podcast five years ago to help collectors and educate people and and do more with that and of course bringing people on like yourself uh is and, and I I will believe a lot of people will be listening to this conversation very carefully because they are very big fans of Chris Achilles and that's uh and of course just to let my listeners know what you don't know behind the scenes here is we spent an hour troubleshooting our zoom call so we uh we've been on the we've been on this for a couple hours now but uh uh I I really want to first of all let me I want to thank you Tasha for being on the podcast today you you've enlightened me with so many things and of course I think I I've enlightened you with a few things as well. Always. And so, um, so my guest is Tasha Achilleos. Uh, so uh, listeners, uh, I'm going to, um, to my listeners here, stay tuned for the most outrageous offer. We'll be right back. 
the vervoids are probably the best dirty joke in Doctor Who. They're hermaphroditic plants. A lot of plants are. So there you but go. Yeah. That's it's based on science. No, well, they'll ship anything. There are probably eleven and handle shippers out there. You just have to drill a hole where his mouth is, and you're all set. You know yeah. he needs the room. I've seen it in pictures. I'm not saying you're not a fan. I'm saying you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Doctor Who gives a fuck. a drunken Doctor Who podcast for the end times. You are invited on an adventure across all of time and space, in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Goldbranson, Asad Cheshki, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire Who-niverse. On Shuffle. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. Keep collecting. Hi, I'm Rupert Boo. I am known as Paul Ferry. And my name is Barry Williams. Together, we host Time Ram. Time Ram's a cruel mistress. It's a random number generator. That also. We roll a number from 1 to 30, and that's our Doctor. Then 1 to 300 for the story, and then we ram them together. Even if it doesn't make sense. Cruel, I tell you. Time round. Putting the wrong Doctors in the wrong stories, so you don't have to. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Hello fellow time travelers and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so I'm joined by a two to three person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979, that would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including Dalton Hughes and Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast on the Direction Point Podcast Network. Keep collecting! my travelings throughout the universe, I have battled against evil, against power-mad conspirators. I should have stayed here. The oldest civilization, decadent, degenerate, and rotten to the core. Power-mad conspirators, Daleks, Sontarans, Cybermen. They're still in the nursery compared to us. Ten million years of absolute power. That's what it takes to be really corrupt. And now it's time for the most outrageous offer. The most outrageous offer is a Doctor Who item or Doctor Who related item that is priced by a seller to be a little ridiculous or crazy or way above what it should be or ten times what it's selling for. And there's no good reason for that. So today we have a book. The book is called The Scientific Secrets of Doctor Who. Um, it is uh, it is a book uh, by, let's see here, Dr. Um, by Simon Grier and Dr. Merrick Kukala. And uh, this is a BBC book. And uh, it looks like it was published. Uh, let's see, when was it published? Doesn't say. 2015, it looks like. 2015. So... There we go. Um, this book is available in hardcover or paperback, and this happens to be uh, the uh, paperback version of this book. And it is a seller from Austin, Texas, called Campbell Bookstores. I have not been able to verify whether that's a real store or an online store, but they've been on uh, this. Uh, this is from Abe Books, and so they've been on Abe Books since November 1st of 2021, so not very long. They do have a, a solid seller rating. And uh, it looks like, let's see, it says, uh, mind-bending blend of story and science that will help you see Doctor Who in new light. That's from the back. Uh, it says brand new, brand new copy, paperback edition. Okay, new. He is, uh, by the way, shipping within the United States is $3. He is asking $1,128.68. Alarm bells should be going off because it's not... 
you know, the, these uneven amounts usually bother me, but uh, that book certainly does not go for that uh, price. Uh, we looked around, and for one thing, we found it on Amazon.com. You can get the paperback book for $10.36 or used from $6.38. Uh, I also found it on eBay, buying it used for $10.36. You can also find it on a books for $10.36. So that seems to be the going rate for this book. Uh, incidentally, you can find the hardcover edition for $9.38, so a little bit cheaper on the hardcover. Um, that just seems crazy. Why would you spend $1,100? We, of course, reached out to the seller and received no reply. So, and of course, uh, we, of course, have the link uh, up on our website for this. Uh, sometimes the links disappear, especially after I write to them and say, hey, you know, is this the right price? Or was it supposed to be 1128 and you just got crazy with the decimal point? That makes more sense. Um, but, you know, we see these all the time. I get, I get emails, I get messages, I get all kinds of stuff from people saying, hey, this is crazy. Absolutely. Some of them are crazy. Some of them, not so crazy. You know, when you see a book out there that's being sold for $1,100, let's find out why. Um, not too many of them are out there, or it's the only one out there. Of course, when a second one pops up, that usually prompts the first seller to go, eh, I'm not going to get that, so I'm going to have to bring it down. But they're hoping it sells before a second one comes out. In many cases, these bookstores that have these ridiculous prices, and we did this, by the way, if you want to dial back uh, to the previous episode, look for the episode where I interview David J. Howe for The New Who Adventures. Um, he, come, he has a theory that some of these stores are online only, and they're robots. They're not even real stores. So there's a guy here who's offering this book for this price. He doesn't have the book in stock. He's going to buy it from seller B, who may also not have that book in stock. So they buy it from seller C, who is going to direct ship it to seller A, who's then going to ship it to you, which means uh, how long is it going to take for you to get this book? Well, that's that's one thing. And of course, I haven't been able to verify with the seller whether or not it's in stock, whether they're a real store. I don't know. You know, if you, if you happen to know the Campbell Bookstore in Austin, Texas, if it's a real place, let me know. I'd like to be correct about this. I want to make sure I can get a link and get other, all this. I, I try to have everything as factual as I possibly can. Of course, if the link disappears, I do have a copy of the printout, which I will put up on, on the website as well, so you can see that it actually existed. So there you go. Um, that is the most outrageous offer. And that wraps up the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast for the 64th episode. I want to thank my wonderful guest, Ms. Tasha Achilleos, um, who gave me a great interview. And we're excited to know that Chris Achilleos' print shop will be set up again. His children are working on that. And as soon as that's ready to go, we will be the first to let you know. Um, and uh, it's just amazing how involved in Doctor Who Tasha was and how amazing she was with with all of the um, uh, all the people that came to her side when Chris passed away. I was fortunate enough to even be invited to his funeral virtually. And I you know, was honored to be there. It was a, a great honor for my my, form, my, my my dear friend, Chris, who who was got lost too soon. So anyway, um, that's a wonderful thing. What's going on next episode? Episode 65 is tentative, but I think we're going to do it. We're going to do classic hardcovers, 1982, with my returning guest, Professor Tony Witt, who gives me the insight to the story. And I'll tell you about that very short year of only nine hardcovers in that particular year. So there you go. Uh, we thank you for listening. We are a Direction Point Network podcast. Be sure to check us out at DrWhoCollectors.com. Keep collecting. Direction Point! Direction Point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network.